from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good evening. My name is James Wintle from the Music Division of the Library of Congress here. Um, I'm going to talk this morning or this evening about uh, the music of uh, Olivier Messiaen, which uh, specifically the Quartet for the End of Time, which is going to be on the concert this evening, as you probably know. Um, usually these pre-concert talks have some particular connection with the collections at, in the Music Division. Um, this one doesn't uh, in particular, but I did want to mention for the sake of continuity that um, although we do not in the music division have a manuscript of the Quartet for the End of Time, of course we have first edition, first printed edition of the piece uh, with lots of really good information in it, but we do uh, in the music division have the manuscript of Messiaen's Turin Galila Symphony, which is a major work that is actually going to be performed at the National Symphony tomorrow night. Um, and is a wonderful piece of music. It was one of the commissions uh, from the Kusevitsky Foundation at the library and is, in a way, uh, connecting this to our collections in the music division in a kind of loose way in that it's all happening this weekend and we're all here in the library. So at least there is, there is that. Um, I did want to talk about this piece in particular because I feel like it is an important piece of music and a, and a really... Um, has a story behind it that I think is really uh, interesting and, and, and can enhance your, your listening of the piece, um, maybe more so than usual. Uh, if you don't know the background, you'll, you'll see what I mean. Um, so, I'll go ahead and get started. Um, in the preface of his uh, published score of the Quartet for the End of Time, there's actually quite a lot of information uh, that Messiaen wrote, uh, including the following biblical quote from the 10th chapter of the Revelation of St. John. And this is, let's see, uh, William Blake's uh, depiction of the 10th chapter of the Revelation of St. John, which I think is a rather dramatic image. Um, and here is the quote, quote, And I saw another mighty angel coming down from heaven, wrapped in a cloud with a rainbow on his head. His face was like the sun and his legs like pillars of fire setting his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land, and standing on the sea and on the land, he raised his right hand toward heaven and swore by he who lives forever and ever, saying, there will be no more time, but in the days when the seventh angel is to blow his trumpet, the mystery of God will be fulfilled. Messian continues in the preface, this piece is directly inspired by the above passage from Revelation. Its musical language is essentially ethereal, spiritual, Catholic, with a capital C. The modes, realizing melodically and harmonically a sort of tonal ubiquity, bring the listener closer to infinity, to eternity in space. The special rhythms, independent of the meter, powerfully contribute to the effect of banishing the temporal, end quote. Olivier Messiaen was a French composer, pianist, organist, and teacher who became a preeminent force in contemporary music from his earliest major works written around 1930 until his death in 1992. As a boy, Messiaen was quite precocious in his musical studies. He began to compose and play the piano around the age of eight. He fell in love with the great works of Mozart, Berlioz, and Wagner, and even asked his parents for uh, opera scores for Christmas when he was a young boy. Uh, he entered the Paris Conservatoire at in 1919 when he was only about 11 years old. And by that time, Messiaen had also developed a love for the music of Debussy, particularly his opera, Pelleas et Melisande. Uh, and in Debussy's music, the young Messiaen really found a connection to the sense of tonal ambiguity in Debussy's music and also the overall impressionistic aesthetic um, and the sense of motion, I think, within the music without being metered. I think that's an important aspect that we hear in Messiaen's music as well. Uh, during his early years at the Conservatoire, Messiaen had a number of important influences that were able to help him develop his own distinctive musical language at a relatively early stage in his composing career, a language that would serve him well throughout the rest of his life. 
For instance, his music history professor, Maurice Emmanuel, was an expert in the music and poetry of ancient Greece and taught a course on the musical applications of Greek meter. Messiaen's organ teacher as well, Marcel Dupre, also used Greek rhythmic meters as a basis for organ improvisations. Messiaen relayed his understanding of the subject in this way, quote, Greek meters rely on a simple and essential principle. They are composed of shorts and longs. The shorts are equal and the long equals two shorts. Meter is quite simply the grouping of two feet, the foot being a rhythm composed of a certain number of shorts and longs, each having a precise name. These name end quote. Uh, these names are things like iams and troches, the sort of thing that we all learned uh, perhaps in high school English class when we were studying Shakespeare, which is usually written in iambic pentameter, meaning five feet pentameter of iams, badeep, 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 that rhythm, right? So we all maybe most of us remember that sort of thing. Um, so from there, Messian had been studying this uh, concept of Greek meter and the idea of looking at the, the minute elements of music and combining them together in various ways to make larger forms, okay? So drilling, drilling down to the smallest unit of measure to make something uh, that was distinctly his own. And from there, uh, studying Greek meter, Messian began to look at other resources to help him develop his understanding of rhythm in particular. Uh, one of the major works that he came across was a 13th century treatise uh, on Indian classical music called The Ocean of Music. Of course, it was written originally in Hindi, but in English it's called The Ocean of Music. Uh, here he found a new system of grouping short and long beats, not completely divorced from the Greek method, in that they were units of rhythm constructed through the grouping of various short and long beats. However, the groupings were longer and contained a wider variety of combinations than are found in Western music. Messian was able to use a combination of the two systems to devise his own method of grouping irregular numbers of beats inside a larger rhythmic pulse, and it is this micro level of rhythm that is really one of the things that makes uh, Messian's music so distinctive. In the Quartet for the End of Time, he employs what he called added value rhythms, in which he includes an extra small note within a normally, a seemingly regular metric idea. He adds a little extra small note just to keep you, uh, keep you off balance. And that can be either an actual note, a dot, or a rest, but just a little bit of extra time uh, that fit into this, this otherwise standard metric organization. Um, we can see this in action at the beginning of the sixth movement of the quartet, called Dance of the Fury for Seven Trumpets. And we'll do a little, let me see. Uh, here we go. There's a little bit of that, and you can see here. <laughs> example when I'm going to play it one more time so you can get a sense of how it goes but even though we're dealing with mainly eighth notes and quarter notes the pulse of the music is actually the half note right and now you can really feel that in this in this performance I think that he's grouping what would normally be two two time here with two groups of you know quarter note length music except he has this extra 16th note in it to give it that extra sort of rise in the beat. So if you think about it in terms of half measure groupings, you get a sense of how this, how this sort of extra rhythmic pulse within it really works. So let's just listen to it one more time and example in particular having everyone sort of play the same notes and everything gives you gives you a pretty clear sense of what of what Messian was trying to accomplish there so um, with that uh, through Indian music and the combination of Greek and uh, and Indian music in particular um, he found new ways of organizing these larger groups of rhythms these uh, these longer uh, units of measure uh, 
And uh, one of the ways that he did this uh, in the Quartet for the End of Time, besides this added value idea, uh, was to put together what he called, uh, or what he called, but what he found in this uh, 13th century Indian treatise, uh, was called a non-retrogradable rhythm. This is another one of, the, one of the rhythmic methods that he uses for organizing this particular piece of music. And the reason I'm talking about this specific stuff is because in the preface of the score, because it was really a new way of composing and a new way of putting together music, Messian really takes time to lay this all out for anyone who's going to look at the score or anyone who's going to play the score and explain this, this sort of uh, um, uh, example outside of the context of the actual music is straight from the, the preface of the Quartet for the End of Time. So I want to show you this. Um, also, these, they're divided by bar line, even though that doesn't always happen within the music. Um, and you see here the idea of non-retrogradable rhythm being it's the same, obviously it's the same backward as it is forward. And so it works as a unit of rhythm which will not necessarily be the same length as whatever melodic unit of measure Messiaen is using. So if, for instance, he has a set of seven non-retrogradable rhythms, he might have a set of five notes that he's using as a melodic cell and then those are sort of off kilter until he gets to a common denominator and they come together at some point, right? So here we have uh, a dotted eighth, a quarter, sixteenth note, half note, and then that acts as the pivot point. Backwards, you see the same thing, right? Um, Non-retrogradable rhythm sounds like a kind of daunting term, but in fact it's a, it's a fairly simple idea that you just it's just a palindrome. And the way it works within the music, obviously, is not something that you're necessarily going to hear, um, particularly on your first listen of the piece. But there is a point to this, <laughs> that um, the way Messiaen is constructing music, he's taking these smaller elements and making slightly larger and slightly larger constructions out of both the rhythm and the notes, as we'll see. Um, ties into really his whole concept of what it means to write music, and in particular his concept of time, which is really the point of this whole piece, the quartet for the end of time, and how time functions outside of our normal concept of the clock in a more spiritual way, all right? So, um, this idea of non-retrogradable rhythm is important, um, as well as the added value rhythms, as far as how that works within this piece. Um, also, when he was at the conservatory, um, he studied with Marcel Dupre, who was his organ teacher, and also his comp composition teacher was Paul Ducat. Um, Paul Ducat, for us, is a bit of a misunderstood figure, and I feel compelled to say something about this, because it doesn't necessarily have anything to do with what I'm talking about, but I, I, I have to give a plug, at least, for Paul Ducat, because he was very important um, composition teacher in Paris uh, during the first part of the century and also was quite a wonderful opera composer. And because of uh, certain films starring certain cartoon mice, we think about Paul Ducat in a certain way based on his, uh, based on his uh, composition, The Sorcerer's Apprentice, only. Um, but if you get a chance to look further into his, uh, his set of works, I would, I would encourage you to do that because there's quite a lot more there than the dancing brooms, if I can <laughs> say that. Um, so, anyway, uh, Paul Ducat was uh, Messiaen's uh, composition teacher, um, and he, as well as Marcel Dupre, his organ professor, was quite interested in the, in the use of medieval modes, the whole system of how uh, scales go together and how they were done uh, in the Middle Ages. So, um, Messian uh, is thinking here about larger organizational systems, again, based on the smallest unit of music. In rhythms, it was um, dealing with short beats and long beats. In notes, in terms of scales, he's dealing with half steps and whole steps. In Western music, at least, that tends to be the unit of measure for constructing a scale. And whether it's a major or minor scale that we think about in terms of modern music, or if it's a medieval mode, coincidentally the major and minor scale were two of the medieval modes, they just happened to last a little longer than the other ones, um, this idea of half steps and whole steps and how they're put together is really the key to understanding 
scales, and scales then being the fundamental building blocks of tonal music, or modal music for that matter. And how that combination of notes then, a composer uses those combination of notes uh, either at the same time or individually to make either melody or harmony, right? So, um, we have this uh, idea of modal music, um, and Messian in particular uh, is interested in taking this idea of half steps and whole steps within uh, a normal major or minor scale um, and changing around the concept a little bit. So it's not just like, say, a major scale, for instance, whole step, whole step, half step, whole step, whole step, whole step, half step, like you would get the notes of a major scale. Instead, he's taking these smaller units of measure and putting them together in different ways, like alternating half steps and whole steps, where you get a, something called an octatonic scale, which is simply half step, whole step, half step, whole step, until you get to an octave, and coincidentally, that kind of idea gives you eight notes instead of seven, which is why it's called an octatonic scale. Um, or he's using a whole tone scale, like you would hear um, in the music of Debussy, or there are other ways that he, that he goes about uh, doing this. So this idea of playing with the construction of the scale within the music gives the listener on certain occasions a sense that they're hearing something familiar, but it's not quite the way that it's supposed to be. There's something a little bit off. And I want to play you an, another example of the f from the fourth movement of the Quartet for the End of Time, where he's writing a melody that sounds vaguely like it's in E major, vaguely like a major scale. But in fact, uh, it ends up, if you look through the whole thing, it ends up being based on, uh, an, on, on an octatonic scale, this idea of alternating whole steps and half steps. So this scale, uh, it's something that uh, he probably learned, Messian probably learned from listening to Stravinsky, uh, the octatonic scale, but it's not something that Stravinsky invented. In fact, in late 19th century Russian opera, you find the octatonic scale in works by people like Rimsky, Korsakov, and this sort of thing. You find the octatonic scale used in kind of an interesting way because the harmony that comes out of the scale is not a normal major, minor, blum, blum, blum sort of thing. Um, in 19th century Russian opera, Rimsky, Korsakov specifically, he would have um, usually some sort of supernatural element in the plot of the piece, in the, of the opera, right? And the music that he would write would be normal sounding sort of major minor music for the human characters, and then the mystical characters or the magical characters would be represented by music that was based on octatonic scales or something like that, that produced a more kind of ethereal, mysterious sound. And this kind of sound is something that I think is very close to uh, what Messian is trying to do here with uh, expressing something beyond the temporal, expressing something beyond human understanding, beyond our normal thought of what exactly music is. But here, um, here I, it's not so much that. Uh, here he's doing something uh, that I think is kind of interesting in that he's dealing with this unusual scale to give us as listeners a sense of normalcy, but then you listen to it and you think, oh wait, I thought that was going to be what I expected, but it's not really. Okay? So he's, he's setting us up for something that he doesn't really deliver. Um, and here in particular, he's, he's setting us up to think this piece is going to be an E major. And the way that he does that, in the, in the key of E major, you have a tonic triad, meaning a, a chord built on the note E a triad built on the, the, the scale, the main scale note, is going to be something that is the strongest sense of that key, particularly moving from five to one is going to give you the strongest sense that you can have that you are in a particular key. And if you look at this melody, if you look at the violin line, particularly because it's in C, you don't want to look at the clarinet line because clarinet lines are hard to read because they're in the wrong key. Um, so uh, here you have um, him doing these uh, three note patterns, da -da -dum, right? Right up to the third scale degree. So you have that da -da -dum, immediately outlining the first part of an E major triad. From the fifth up to the octave. 
So he goes from one to three, back down to one. One, three, five. One, five, one. Right? So and in that melody, you get a really strong sense that you're actually going to listen to something in E major. But, excuse me, right off the bat, you get an F natural in the mix. So maybe it sounds sort of Eastern European or something because it has this half step at the beginning. But it goes fast enough that I don't even think that, uh, I don't even think there's really a, necessarily a sense of what's going on for, for the first time listener at least because you get this sense that something's going to go on in E major but in fact it doesn't at all. So I want to hear a little bit of that from the fourth movement. <laughs> especially if you've not heard this piece before. Um, I don't want to give too much away, but um, <laughs> I don't want to ruin the ending for you. Um, but anyway, you have this sense of, of key um, that is close to something traditional, but not quite there. It's something um, that Messian, again, is drilling down to the smallest unit of measure to find out how to manipulate music from the smallest point into something that is essentially original to himself. And one of the things about Messiaen as a composer uh, in the 20th century, there were, and in many, many centuries, uh, there have been schools of composition. One composer innovates and others follow, and there are these sort of groups of composers that you think about together. And Messiaen, I think, is important, if for nothing else, because he doesn't really belong to any of those groups, because he was a young man who looked at the resources of music history and, from, and looked at how he related to the world and the universe at large, came up with a method of composition that really spoke from his heart and stuck with it and made music that was really uh, interesting and new throughout his life and, I, and was respected for that. Um, so I, th I think that's an important thing to remember, uh, that Messiaen was consistent in his approach to uh, composition. Um, the consistency of his approach to composition was also something uh, that was pervasive in other parts of his life. Uh, in 1931, um, let me do that so we see a picture of the man himself here. Um, in 1931, just after he left the conservatory and had, had, had uh, come to realize these various things about how he wanted to put music together. He took a post as an organist at La Trinité in Paris. Um, this was his first position as an organist and one that he kept for 60 years. This is someone who became a world famous composer, traveled all over, but still would go and play Sunday services in Paris at this church uh, for 60 years. And I think that that is a testament to his uh, devotion uh, to uh, religious matters as well as his uh, sense of consistency about what he wanted to do with his life. He found out what he wanted to do and he did it. Um, and whether he's writing some of his organ music or the quartet for the end of time, uh, Messiaen believed and wrote on numerous occasions that the point of his music was to, quote, manifest the doctrines of Christian faith, end quote. Um, however, his concept of Christian faith is maybe a little unusual. It's mystical. It's mystical in the way that we think about the world maybe of a medieval monk or uh, someone who is dealing with uh, the mysteries and the, and the unknowable parts of religion. And Messian um, really embraced that. He embraced the inherent mysteries of faith by using music 
as a voice with which he could comment on what were ultimately unknowable things about the universe. And he uses music as a way to do that. The sorts of things that people can't really talk about intelligently because there's no way to know the answer to these questions. Music is the key for Messian and for many other people to give voice to those questions and possible answers to them. And I think that's one of the things that we find in this quartet for the end of time is this concept of time and space and what exactly it means. Um, one of the things that um, I think is really at work in Messian's music um, is the idea of sacred space. That time in his concept moves from a strict measuring of passing moments to a larger concept that envelops all time into a single moment that is the present. And the idea of sacred space uh, in liturgical practice is the idea that you have a liturgy in the Christian church, in the Catholic and Episcopal churches, other liturgical uh, churches, and within that liturgy there is a sacred space that those words exist in and that you as a, mem as a participant in that activity exist in while you're doing it. And so while you are in that so-called sacred space, you are not only there, but you are also in every other utterance and every other instance of that happening. And so the past and the future and the present all meld into one concept. Um, and I think that that's something that, that Messian was very aware of and something that affected not only his personal um, sense of self, but, in, but it, it uh, affected how he wrote music and why he did things like little added eighth notes or little added uh, 16th notes within otherwise normal uh, metric organizations and why he played with the idea of time so even if you had a sense of the half note, you didn't really have a sense of the eighth note because it really wasn't something that you can, that you can put your fingers on and you can conceive of, all, conceive of all the time. And I think that this sense of sacred space is uh, critical in understanding why this music sounds the way it sounds because of his belief in this mystical uh, this mystical Christian idea of how the universe worked and how time is not something that is strictly measurable. So, um, let's see, we have, uh, do, 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 do. sorry, just one second. Time is not the same as you might think. <laughs> All right, so, sorry about that. Um, so we have the basic elements of time within Messian's music uh, and the basic concept of time within how one shuffles pages, that sort of thing. Um, and another, another aspect of that, the other, another aspect of this, I, this larger concept of what it means for, uh, for Messian to, um, to deal with the universe and to know these unknowable things uh, another important aspect that manifests itself in his music is the idea of uh, birds and bird song. Um, in particular, um, Messian went out into the forests and into the fields and actually took a notebook and wrote down, he listened and wrote down bird songs and he used them in his music. When he was writing uh, the Quartet for the End of Time in the 1940s, he had not done much of that work by that point, but was still familiar with bird songs and utilized them in, uh, in this piece in particular. Uh, in his later works, uh, in particular, I'm thinking of uh, an organ work called uh, The Mysteries of the Holy Trinity from 1969. He writes the bird song, identifies the bird song within the score of the piece. So when you're playing the organ and you look at the music, it says 
Nightingale, and then there's a Nightingale call, and it says Finch, and then there's a Finch call, exactly notated within the otherwise very, well, completely complicated organ music that's going on. Um, so his, uh, his understanding of these uh, and how to use them as musical elements changed and became more specific as his music progressed. In the Quartet for the End of Time, in particular, since that's what we're going to talk about, um, in the preface of the piece, uh, Messian introduces the scene of the first movement like this. Between three, this is a quote, between three and four o'clock in the morning, the birds awaken. A solo blackbird or nightingale improvises, surrounded by dust whirls of sound, by a halo of harmonics, lost high up in the trees. Transpose this onto a religious plane, you have the harmonious silence of heaven. The clarinet in this excerpt, end quote, the, the uh, clarinet and the violin act as birds, the bird calls within this beginning of the piece, and the cello you'll hear in particular um, gives you this idea of the halo of harmonious sound, and we'll hear how that works here. idea of, uh, of bird song, and this is, a again, a very early example of how Messian used this as a way to connect with nature and a way to, uh, you know, a way to harness the divine spark, in fact, in his music uh, through, this, uh, through this idea of, of bird song. Um, Messian's Quartet for the End of Time was first performed on the 15th of January, 1941. It was written while the composer was a prisoner of war. Messian had served compulsory military service from 1933 to 34 and was called up for active duty when France and Great Britain declared war on Germany in September of 1939. Messian was captured by the Germans in June of 1940. For many French soldiers, it did not take long for that to happen, as you probably all know. Um, and he was initially taken to a makeshift camp near Nancy. Uh, there he met the clarinetist, Henri Akoka, and struck up a friendship. While he was at that makeshift site, uh, Messian composed a short solo piece for Akoka, which would eventually become the third movement of the quartet that we're going to hear tonight. Messian, Akoka, and the cellist, Etienne Pasquier, were moved to Stalag 8A, located near Görlitz, which is one of the easternmost cities in, Euro in Germany, uh, it's very close to the English, or the English, very close to the Polish border, uh, and they were moved there in July of 1940. Uh, Messian describes his arrival at Stalag 8A uh, in his later years in this way. Upon arriving, this is a quote directly from Messian, uh, upon arriving in the camp at Görlitz in Silesia, called in military jargon Stalag 8A, like all the other prisoners, I was at once stripped of my clothing. Naked though I was, I continued to guard with a fearsome look, a satchel containing all my treasures. That is to say, a little library of pocket orchestral scores. That would be my consolation when the Germans themselves, like the Germans themselves, I suffered from hunger and cold. This eclectic little library ranged from the Brandenburg Concerti of Bach to the lyric suite of Berg." End quote. Messian, in fact, was allowed to keep his scores, uh, his orchestral scores, and in fact, uh, when the soldiers in charge of the camp found out that he was a composer of some renown, uh, he was encouraged by them to compose and given leave from the normal routine of manual labor in the camp. 
the cellist Etienne Pasquier also, uh, though he was initially given the job of breaking rocks in a quarry to make headstones, I mean, what other kind of horrific sort of thing would you have to do than that? Um, he had an accident one day with a chainsaw while he was breaking these rocks. He didn't hurt himself, but he almost did. And one of his uh, fellow prisoners said to the guard, this man is a cellist and he's uh, risking his livelihood by doing this work. And when they found out that he too was a, was a musician and someone who had these artistic leanings, he was given a, an easier job in the, in the kitchen instead of having to go out and do this hard labor. Um, so um, while they were at the camp, we have uh, the clarinetist, uh, the cellist, and, and Messian all knowing each other already. They had been there for a little while when the fourth member of the ensemble that would eventually premiere the quartet for the end of time came uh, to the camp. His name was Jean Le Boulair, and he was a violinist. Uh, not long after the composer met Boulair, he composed a short trio for clarinet, uh, violin, and cello, and that would eventually become the fourth movement of the quartet um, called Intermed, uh, and that is the piece that we heard a little bit of earlier, the one that sounded like it was going to be an E major, but then it wasn't, where he fooled us all. That was the one. Um, that trio uh, was actually the second part of the quartet that Messiaen wrote, the first being, of course, the solo clarinet movement. Then this trio. And here, uh, still, um, Messiaen was not conceiving of the idea of writing a whole quartet. He was writing smaller, uh, occasional pieces for the instruments and the people that he had at hand. First only his friend Henri, and then this trio. Eventually, um, after the trio had, perform the, had performed this little uh, movement that Messiaen had written for them and rehearsed in the camp washrooms uh, so they could have some sort of, I guess, acoustical feedback or something, um, then um, the camp authorities finally found, after a while, an upright piano uh, for Messian to use, which is quite out of tune, according to Messian's recollection. And the composer was able to start to work in earnest on this quartet uh, for the end of time. Uh, given the unusual ins instrumentation at Messian's disposal, uh, questions of balance became a problem. The clarinet, uh, violin, cello, piano is not a standard ensemble. And how to write for those instruments and make it, uh, make it balanced correctly was, was something that Messian struggled with. And one of the ways that he solved that issue was by changing up the instrumentation throughout the piece. Uh, within the eight movements of the quartet, he changes instrumentation quite often. Um, the entire quartet plays for the first two movements, but then the clarinet drops out very soon after the second movement starts, so you get basically a trio at that point. Um, the third is again for solo clarinet, the fourth being this trio that he had written uh, earlier. Uh, the fifth movement is for cello and piano, the sixth for the entire ensemble, uh, but playing the same pitches for most of it as we heard a little bit of. Uh, and that idea of who's playing what, whether they're playing unison lines or, uh, as we heard in the first movement, the clarinet and violin having a particular role in the texture, the, the cello having this kind of harmonious halo of sound, and then the piano doing these uh, series of chords, how all of these instruments fit together and how they're grouped, again, is another thing that when we go in and actually listen to the music, we can have, that's something to listen for. Who's playing when and who's playing with each other? And these are the kinds of problems that, that Messian really had to work to solve within, within the composition of this piece. And then, of course, the last movement is uh, for only a violin and piano. Of course, within these movements, we have instruments dropping in and dropping out and playing a variety of roles. Um, given the circumstances in which this was written, uh, this is a poster from the original premiere of the piece. We see down at the bottom, if I can use my little pointer here, uh, down at the bottom, the list of the names of the, uh, of the musicians and all the date of the piece, of course. Um, and this is, as you see here, um, stamped by the prison camp here. And this is Stalag 8A itself. This is what it looked like. And this is where uh, Messian and, and the other musicians were. Uh, these buildings were 
where not that one specifically, but that kind of building was the sort of thing um, that they were using for rehearsal and, and for performance. Uh, given the circumstances, one is apt to wonder how Messian was able to acquire the tools needed for composition. I would imagine that the simplest things like pencils and paper can become precious commodities in a situation like this. Luckily for Messian, there was a guard named Hauptmann Karl Albert Brühl, who was sympathetic to his cause and provided him with pencils, erasers, and staff paper that he needed to complete his work. Brühl was a German lawyer who was working at the camp as a prison guard. According to recollections from people who were in the camp, he was a German nationalist but an anti-Nazi. He spoke fluent French, and while he was a guard in the camp, he took special care to help the Jewish prisoners who were in the camp, many of whom were able to pass undetected from the guards. And these people who were able to pass undetected included the clarinetist, uh, Henri Akoka, who was um, not um, taken away you know, uh, because of the, the, abil the ability of this guard to help them sort of stay under the radar. Um, of course, Messin's ability to write down his music did not guarantee a performance. Uh, Henri Akoka was the only person in the camp who actually had a personally owned instrument with him. Uh, his clarinet was the only one. The camp itself had, according to an, an interview with Jean Le Boulair, the violinist, had four or five violins, one or two cellos, and this upright piano, which was horribly out of tune, apparently. Um, so Messian's instrumentation for the quartet was geared not only to the people at hand, but also to the instruments that were available. And those few instruments had to be shared among 30,000 prisoners who were in this camp. And there were English prisoners, groups of English prisoners and groups of Polish prisoners that wanted to give regular musical performances. So it wasn't just this group and a whole bunch of other people off gardening. It was many people who were interested in the arts and interested in musical performance. Um, and the violinist Boulair says that it was, again, this guard rule that made sure they were able to get what they needed as far as the, the actual instruments. Um, there is a popular detail of the story uh, concerning the instruments that came from the composer's own recollection of of the premiere, and this goes that the cello that Etienne Pasquier played at the premiere only had three strings. And it's a very dramatic, you know, it's a very dramatic scene, and Messian was sort of famous for this, um, for re recalling things in the most dramatic terms possible. But um, that the cello, in fact, was this old dilapidated cello that only had three strings, um, something that many of us learned uh, when we first learned about this piece. In fact, um, <laughs> Pasquier himself, the, the cellist, um, remembers things differently. And in fact, he recalls being taken by two armed guards into town to pick out a cello for himself from a dealer in Gerlitz and using 65 marks that he had collected from his fellow prisoners because they knew he was a cellist and didn't have any conceivable way to perform, uh, he took up a collection from his fellow prisoners and went into town with these two armed guards with guns, you know, and everything, um, and was able to pick out a cello from this dealer that the, that the camp, I guess, had some sort of thing with. Um, when he returned to the camp that evening, he played uh, for the camp until their curfew, uh, treating them to favorite classical pieces for solo cello, including uh, the work of Saint-Saëns and Bach. Uh, Stalag 8A would later have a resident jazz band and a whole classical orchestra, um, but in, in these first years of the war when Messian was there, they had uh, chamber music concerts and a variety show in a theater that they had on the camp. So apparently the variety show would start at seven o'clock and they would have a pre-concert chamber performance. And they would tell people, don't come until seven o'clock unless you want to hear classical music. Um, <laughs> but I suppose the lack of entertainment brought people there, of course. And um, there was supposedly full houses for these concerts on a fairly, on a fairly regular basis. In, a, in addition to the, uh, in addition to the concert hall, or the place they used for a concert hall within, uh, within the camp, they also had a lecture hall where people would come from the outside and also prisoners were able to 
give talks about their particular areas of expertise. Um, there were Catholic priests that came and gave sermons and different people came and talked about a variety of topics. And actually, before the, before the quartet was written, Messian himself gave a lecture at this lecture hall in the camp. And the lecture was on the subject of the biblical book of Revelations. He didn't see that coming. Um, and it was titled, Colors and Numbers in the Apocalypse. And it was perhaps this lecture that, uh, the thinking about the book of Revelation was perhaps this lecture that, that sparked the idea for Messian to write the quartet for the end of time on this particular text. Given the circumstances, he was always going to write something, but why it's focused on this particular text instead of any of the myriad of other texts it could be, maybe because of this particular lecture and because there was a priest who had come in and asked him specifically to, uh, to talk about it. So um, in closing, I want to say that uh, Messian's Quartet for the End of Time is not only a wonderful piece of music, as you will hear in a few minutes, it is also a testimony to the spirit of the artist and the strength of faith, both of which can survive and even flourish even in the worst uh, possible circumstances. The, perf the first performance of the Quartet for the End of Time was described by Messian in the following way, quote, an upright piano was brought into the camp, very out of tune, the keys of which seemed to stick at random. On this piano, I played my quatuor pour la fin de temps in front of an audience of 5,000 people. Realistically, there were probably 400 people there. This is just a side note. Um, but he played, according to himself, in, an audience, in front of an audience of 5,000 people, the most diverse mixture of all classes in society, farm workers, laborers, intellectuals, career soldiers, doctors, and priests. Never have I been listened to with such attention and such understanding." End quote. So thank you for coming, and I hope you enjoy the concert, and think about these things that we've talked about maybe a little bit while you're listening to the quartet. I appreciate your attention. Thank you. And if you have any, uh, if you have any questions, uh, now is the time to do that. Anybody have anything that they want to? Yes. Well, oh, okay. I can sing a song. Um, <laughs> yeah, you, I, have, I only have a few karaoke tapes. With me. Okay. Uh, you did a great job of, of introducing us to the granularity of the piece the, at the small scale. Could you just say a few words about the, the overall structure of the piece? It's eight, seven, eight, seven movements, it's and it's eight movements. Eight yeah. movements, and it's, it's kind of the story. And, and each of the movements. Uh, is based on some aspect of this uh, verse from Revelation and some musical uh, way of expressing ideas within that. You have um, the first movement that's called Crystal Liturgy, um, where you have these bird songs, uh, and they're very. You'll see the you'll see the names of the of the movements, which are very evocative. Um, that was one of the things that within this piece that Messian does is give these very evocative names to the, to the movements to give you a sense of really what he's talking about. But the, 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 quote, from, the quote from Revelation really covers the overall structure, I think. I um, mean, he's speaking specifically about different, different parts of that as the, as the piece goes along. I expect you're proud of yourself for having uh, made a mockery of your father's 35 years of telling classes about the three strings on the cello. But it's a personal joke. They're right. There, there, there is an irony in this, though, that is, that is very interesting. You know, there's all this business about, about how accommodating the, the uh, guards were and, and all of this, and it, it seems like a very uh, um, <clears throat> pleasant situation. But isn't it true that uh, in addition to the end of time being related um, to the scripture mm -hmm. and uh, in, a, in a sense uh, a reflection upon uh, the book of, uh, of uh, Revelation, that, uh, that Messian was really also indicting the situation of horror and death uh, in which he found himself. 
and that this was another interpretation of the end of time. It was, the, in a very real sense, uh, the end of time for so many people uh, with whom uh, Messian spent each day. And that it was, in a way, a way of, of indicting that whole sense of, of, uh, of uh, violence and horror in which he found himself, as well as the uh, spiritual aspect of this. Well, I, it, it is, of course, a, a very valid way to look at it, and of course a part of, I'm sure, what must have been in his mind. I mean, he was not living in a vacuum, regardless of how pleasant his recollections of being in a German prison camp are or seem to be, it couldn't have been that nice. Um, so I, 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 your point is well taken and definitely uh, from the perspective of history, it seems that that would be the case. The fact of the matter is that in these later, later day recollections of what exactly was going on, Messian made a point of saying that this is in fact not about the prison camp. It is about this larger philosophical issue and he wanted specifically, he wanted to move the conversation away from that onto the biblical aspect of what he was doing uh, and, and took great pains to specify it in, in interviews when he, was, when he was recollecting these things. I mean, I think, I think that it, it must be the case that he was thinking about it on, on these multiple levels. But with respect to what he said himself, it is, it is inspired by a biblical text, and that is the critical point of what he's trying to get across. So, uh, Just in case this sheds any light uh, on the previous question, I've, rec I've recently been reading Stephen Walsh's biography of Stravinsky and, uh, and the parts having to do with... Uh, uh, Stravinsky and, and all his friends and associates' reactions to the beginning of uh, World War II. Mm -hmm. And at least according to Walsh, uh, the general feeling uh, among Stravinsky and those other people, and I assume lots of other uh, Americans and Europeans at the time, was that uh, it wasn't just going to be a war where there was going to be some fighting and then things would go back to more or less the way they were. People tended to feel that uh, in, in 1939, 40, 41, that European civilization as they knew it had come to an end, uh, that France in particular was, was ruined for forever, and, uh, and the other uh, sort of non-German uh, cultures were also ruined forever. So um, I, I would tend to think it's very likely that uh, Messiaen felt that way also, and maybe he wanted to, to repudiate uh, his feelings later on. Maybe he didn't want to seem as if he had been short-sighted or unduly pessimistic, but, mm -hmm. uh, but it, se it seems very um, understandable that, that he would regard it as the end of time. Yeah, yeah, good point, thank you. Um, and I think that when we, when we look at particularly these, these interviews that he did with his fellow named Golea, who, which is where a lot of these quotes that I, that I gave you can't come from, uh, we have to take all these things with a grain of salt because when, you know, even within just the small, uh, the small uh, subject of the premiere of this quartet, what Messiaen remembers and what the cellist remembers on many points are not the same. And Messiaen wants to give this sense of drama to what he says and really, as you, as you say, to make himself not seem short-sighted or seem like maybe he wasn't fully aware of you know, what was going on. So I, I, think, I think your point is, is well taken there, definitely. Um, anybody else have any questions or comments? We're getting toward 10 after, so maybe we should uh, have, some, uh, have some fresh air and maybe a drink of water and go see a wonderful concert. What do you say? All right, thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.